Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to warm up with a few songs. Um, first one is Awesome is the Lord Most High. standing for our next song, All I Once Held Dear.
Please be seated. Um, I'll just pray for us. Father God, thank you that we can meet here together. Thank you that uh, you love each one of us and that we can share this time together to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we've got a couple of, uh, some more songs. There's a, There is a Redeemer, which is one of my favourites. You might notice because we sing it a lot. <laughs> Just leave the, yeah, leave it like that. Leave that photo up. Thanks. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure I know where that photo is taken. Does anyone want to take a guess? It's the bite. That's right. I reckon it's a photo of the cliffs at the bite called the Bunda Cliffs. Didn't know they were called that until recently. Um, and uh, it just reminds me. Um, uh, I, I went and worked out on the Nullarbor for a year when I was 19 and that was a, a pretty important year for me um, and that I wasn't a Christian when I went there and I, the year that I ended up, I went there to work for three months over Christmas um, and uh, people got sacked quite regularly and so I ended up staying for a year, I didn't get sacked. Um, and uh, um, and one day uh, we decided to go for a walk. So where the roadhouse is, I worked at the roadhouse on the Nullarbor, and uh, someone said, oh, it's about 10K walk to the cliffs. You can, you can walk there. And so we thought, sort of straight out, and there's no road, so you just walk through the salt bush. And so uh, me and a friend, we decided, oh, why don't we do that, okay? So, so we did that, and uh, as it turns out, it's not 10Ks. <laughs> <laughs> It was more like about 17 or 18 k's. Um, and it's as, I suppose, uh, I can remember the experience thinking it was a lot further than I thought, but also um, 
you're just walking through Saltbush and uh, it, uh, the, the Nullarbor, there's no trees in that particular part, well, in anywhere on the Nullarbor. Um, and uh, so little rises seem like big hills. And you, know, you, you might go up a metre and you can sort of see further into the distance. And so you, you, you go over a little rise and think, oh, it must be there now. And no, we weren't. And, um, and you actually get quite close. You're probably only about 200 metres or so away from the cliffs before you can start to hear the sea. And you, can, you realise you can see a bit of a, a break in the edge of the landscape. And then when you get to the edge, you sort of, you know it's pretty crumbly, so you don't want to um, go over the edge because it, yeah, in those days you'd just be dead. You know, there would be no way of saving you. They wouldn't have had choppers to come and pick you up or any, any of that sort of stuff. So, um, um, and I suppose uh, I thought in our relationship with God, there's some similarities in that, in that um, we know what we're going towards. We know what we're going to see at the end, but we're never really quite sure what the path's going to take us, how long it is, um, and sort of what it's going to be like. Um, and so I thought that was a good metaphor. And I... I I suppose, I, uh, when I first came back from Nullarbor, um, I used to tell a lot of stories about it and uh, I, I picked up the nickname of Nulla because I talked too much, Nullarbor, because it was a bore. <laughs> um, and, uh, but one of the reasons I mentioned it was uh, uh, during that year I read the whole of the New Testament and uh, I wasn't a Christian when I left and by the end of that year I... I knew that I needed to find myself a group of Christians to hang around with. So um, when I came back, I did go to a church. I went to Enfield Baptist Church. And uh, to those people, I became a Christian quite quickly. But it wasn't that quick, really. They, they only saw the end result of what God had been doing in my life. Um, and so I have an interesting story about becoming a Christian. Some people, their story is not that interesting in that it's a slow, gradual process, they, you know, they come to church as kids and they, they, they get to that point where it's their decision but it's not always, you know, it's not an interesting story like this is. So, um, and I've, I find churches are interesting places in that it's, it's our relationship with Jesus that brings us together from quite different backgrounds and I think um, that's what we have in common even though we may not have other things much in common. And that's, that's the power of, of having a relationship with Jesus. All right. Thanks. Um, how can I be free from sin? I think we know how, but we're going to sing the song.
Please be seated. Um, now, I was wondering if I could get uh, Peter and Jan, would you be able to do the offering for us? I just pray for the offering. Father God, thank you that you give us all that we need. You are our source of everything that we need. You are the source of life. Thank you for the privilege of being able to help build your kingdom, to use this money wisely, to further your word that all people may know of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're going to uh, come to a prayer time now, and um, there are many, many things in here that, uh, in the newsletter that we can pray for. Um, and uh, there are many things we can give thanks for too. Uh, I think uh, a couple of weeks ago I asked for prayer for a friend of mine, Brett, who's a, a, a strong Christian friend. He was out riding his, um, he's a very avid bike rider, he, you know, he's ridden to Melbourne and back with a group and stuff like that, so yeah. Anyway, he, and he's about 10 years younger than me, but he, um, he was out riding and he had a heart attack while he was riding. He fell to the ground, he was with a friend who knew how to do CPR did CPR for 20 minutes until the ambulance came, went to hospital, went into a coma for four days. Uh, they tried to bring him out a few times and he didn't respond very well. Anyway, um, uh, this week he, so it's four weeks, that was a go now. Uh, this week he's gone home and he's recovering. He, he's got some um, memory issues but he's getting better every day and so that's just a that's an answer to prayer, you know, and uh, just, um, yes, he's, yeah, he would have been in that least likely category to have a heart attack and do that sort of thing. But uh, so, so if you have answers to prayer, then we can thank God for those as well. So, um, so yeah, in, in the newsletter, there's, there's a number of, uh, for Jill that's having an operation, uh, for Joe and Dorothy, Megan and Kelly, uh, for the AB, AGM and the international situation with Japan and, and Shinzo Abe and, and in Ukraine, of course. So feel free to pray for something that, that the Lord's touching your heart with and um, let's just pray. Now, um, we've got a Bible reading and um, it's Mark 13, 14 to 27, but I actually put in Mark 13 because I thought it goes well. And Peter, I told Peter and he said he'll spit the dummy and walk out, but no, he didn't say that. <laughs> he said he wouldn't do that. Um, so it's Mark 13, 13 to 23. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm in the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. 
How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those days will be of distress unequalled from the beginning when God created the world until now, never to be equalled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At the time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect. If that were possible, if, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. Amen. Um, we're going to sing another song, Purify My Heart, and then uh, Peter's going to come and give us a message. Thank you, Andrew. It's uh, good to be here this morning. Did you miss me? <laughs> That's a stupid question, isn't it? But anyway, um, it's a couple of weeks since I've been up here preaching. It's, I hear you, uh, um, Jeff, last week and then with uh, John the week before. It's, thank you for them for, for stepping in. Last week I was fine, by the way. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I just had positive, but I was fine, so uh, it was all good. It means I was able to do stuff during the day as well, so I got some work, work done at home. But what are you going to do tomorrow? Now, I imagine that you have a number of things, a list of things that maybe you want, maybe one or two things, maybe a big, big long list, depending on what your wife's got, what you want you to do. Um, but when I ask that question, 
Uh, prayerfully, your aunts would go something like this. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. Things can change very quickly and plans can ch instantly change. But, God willing, I plan to. And then you go to the list that your wife has for you. And in big picture language, your plans are prayerfully for the glory of God, no matter what you're doing. What about in 20, 100 or a thousand years time? What are you going to be doing then? You'll still be doing it. You'll still be doing it. It's a big list. Except it won't be your wife's list. <laughs> Sorry. The, the answer is very similar, isn't it? I don't know what I'll be doing, but prayerfully, God willing, I'll be living for the glory of God. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. We do know that sometime soon Jesus will return. And we do know that all of our tomorrows, no matter what happens, are good when we're with, with God. The short-term future has, um, has some difficulties um, for us. But our hope is in God and his promises and, and God is, and our hope in God is what keeps us faithful always. Our passage this morning promises two things. Firstly, it promises tough times, persecutions, sadness, griefs. Not because we are humans, but because we are Christians. And secondly, it gives us hope because the future with God is good. It's wanted. It's looked forward to with great anticipation. I assume we have all thought at some stage, now would be a good time come Lord Jesus. Amen. Yes. There have also been times when we have wanted, just hang on a bit God, just, just a little bit longer. I can remember just before doing exams, I'm thinking now's a good time, don't have to worry about the pain of exams. But then when kids came along, I'm thinking, just hang on a bit, but I just want to see how they, what they grow into, what they do. I want them to come to faith, so just hang on a bit longer. The future is always interesting and unknown, but there are some things that we do know. In our passage this morning, Jesus is continuing to give signs as to what the future holds. And as we seek to understand what Jesus is saying, we need to remember that, he, what, that what he says is in the context of the question that the disciples asked him. They wanted to know when the temple was going to be destroyed. The temple was everything to the Jews. So it was perfectly natural for them to want to know when it was going to be destroyed. At the end of verse 13, Jesus encourages the disciples and in, and, and in a sense is encouraging us to endure to the end. Times are going to be tough, but endure. Remain faithful to God because faithful endurance means salvation. Then in verse 14, Jesus really gives his first answer to their question. If you remember, they asked him, when the temple was going to be destroyed. Jesus says in verse 14, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What is the abomination of desolation? And to understand this more, we need to go back to the Old Testament. Jesus takes the phrase from Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, chapter 11, verse 31, and Daniel 12, verse 11. These passages are describing the defilement of the Jewish temple by an evading army. And the same phrase is used in 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 54. 1 Maccabees is not a part of our Holy Scriptures, what we consider to be our Holy Scriptures. They are part of what I, in tongue-in-cheek, call the Hippocrypha. But it was some writings of the day. 
And in 1 Maccabees chapter 1 verse 54, he uses this phrase to describe Antiochus Epiphanes, who is the Syrian general who enraged the Jews when he set up an altar to Zeus at the altar of burnt offerings in the temple and then he sacrificed a sow on it. This enraged the Jews so much that they revolted against the Syrians and gained their independence. And this happened, this is called the Maccabean Revolt and happened in 168 BC. In its original context, the abomination of desolation was a pagan statue set up in the house of God by Antiochus Epiphanes. Jesus takes this historical event, which the Jews would not have forgotten, and says that it's going to happen again. And when it does, it will be a sign to get out and run. The question is, <clears throat> what does Mark want us to understand by this? And there are two main possibilities. The first one is that Jesus' words are a description or a prophecy of the destruction of the temple by Titus in AD 70. And the abomination that causes desolation is the entrance of Titus into the temple in September of 70 AD. For a Jew, the appearance of an enemy general standing in the temple where he wasn't supposed to be was an abomination. And then for him to destroy the temple like he did, well, that was a tragedy like they'd never experienced before and will never experience again. The fact that this was the fourth destruction of the temple didn't take away the total destruction it was for them. Verse, in verses 14 to 18, Jesus tells a disaster that is coming their way. If you're on your flat top roof, then don't go down inside to get anything. If you're in your field, don't go back to get your cloak. If you are pregnant, then it will be particularly tough for you. Just run. Flee to the mountains. Which is what the Christians did. They were warned, they saw the signs, and they fled. The second thought about what Mark meant is that this time is still a future time and the abomination that causes desolation refers to the man of lawlessness, which is talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. In 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of lawlessness sets himself up in the temple, which would be an abomination to the Jews. So what is Mark referring to? Was Jesus speaking to the Jewish Christians of his day, warning them of the coming destruction of the temple and telling them to flee? Or was he speaking to future Christians, warning them to flee? I believe Jesus was warning the Christians of the day to see the signs and flee. And when you read about what happened to the Jews by Titus in not just AD 70, the whole war was from 66 to 70, it's quite obvious that this is what Jesus is referring to. However, it's also a warning to us. There is a lawlessness in our world that seeks to rob us of our faith. The spirit of Antichrist is around. The Antichrist isn't here yet, but we need to be warned. We need to be aware of all the principles of Satan and of this world that seeks to rob the church, which by the way is the temple of God, seeks to rob us of our holiness. Let me quickly mention four of those principles. Individualism, self-fulfillment, freedom and personal autonomy. Each one of those have Christian understandings. We do stand before God as individuals, but individualism can ruin the church of its corporate nature. We are free in Christ. We are responsible for who we are and what we do, and we are to make choices for the glory of God. But 
The world's understanding of these four principles robs the church and makes us poor. Those worldly principles are an abomination if or when they are a part of our lives. Sadly, we are not immune to those four principles, so we need to be aware and watchful lest we fall further. We are the temple of God. There is no physical temple today, thankfully, and if those four principles stand where they shouldn't be, then we haven't been very watchful. Verses 19 to 23 refers to days of great trial, trouble, affliction, tribulation, and are often taken to mean the days of tribulation before Jesus returns. Certainly, from a first century perspective, it didn't mean that. Jesus was referring to the days immediately before and leading up to the destruction of the temple when Titus was the abomination that causes desolation. Those were terrible days for the Jews. And if you read some of the writings of Josephus, who was a historian of the time, it was really a, a terrible time. At the same time, I don't think it is wrong to expect the church to be persecuted in the days leading up to the return of Jesus. And there are other passages that warn us about that. However, let me hide a couple of things from this passage. Firstly, in verses 20, 22 and 27, Jesus calls our, our attention to his elect. In verse 20, Jesus says that he will shorten the days for the elect. The elect, the chosen people of God, the faithful who have put their trust in God, will survive. They will not be forgotten by God. That doesn't mean that we will escape persecution. It means our hope is secure. Our future is secure. Why? Not because we are special or better or deserving, but because God is faithful to his promises, to his calling and his election of us as his people. In verse 22, Jesus says that the elect will not be led astray. He doesn't say we will not be tempted to be led astray. He says to be led astray if possible. Temptation is always there, but we have been chosen, elected by God, and are to resist temptation with the Holy Spirit's power. I remind you of 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, and I encourage you to go and read it sometime, and then read it again, and have it as a memory verse. In verse 27, Jesus says, he will send his angels to gather his elect from the ends of the earth to the ends of the earth. In other words, no elect, no chosen person will miss out on being gathered up by the angels. What a blessing, a joy, an encouragement to remain faithful to know that as God's elect people, he has not forgotten us. Trouble is always around the corner. But we can never lose our election because, as I've said to you a number of times before, God never says, oops. The second thing I want to highlight from verses 90 to 23 is that even though we are God's elect, we need to be on our guard. Do you recognise when individualism seeks to take control of your life? If you do, when you do, you are on your guard. Do you recognise when freedom, personal autonomy or self-fulfilment seeks to control your life? If you do, then you are on guard. Christianity is not a faith that checks the mind out and you just sort of wander along down life. I hope you never check your mind out when you come in here. 
you can always got to evaluate what I say in the past 12 minutes. I've made I've gone back to 12 and not 10. We got to, our minds have got to be engaged. It's part of being made in the image of God. Yes, we rely upon God, but being made in his image means we also engage our minds, we recognise the unholy pressures that are around us and choose the holy, pleasing to God way of life. This is a way of life that is just as powerful for us today as it was for the first century Christians and as it will be for Christians in the perilous days before Jesus returns. Jesus has prophesied the destruction of the temple, which happened in 70 AD. The physical temple is no more and never will be a part of God's plans. Instead, we are the temple of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean we get it easy. There is trouble ahead. The first century Christians were warned and experienced trouble and so have many Christians over the two millennia since then, and so will we today, and so will Christians of the future until Jesus returns. But it's all going to be worth it because of what, what Jesus did in his coming 2,000 years ago. In verses 24 to 27, which we'll look at next week in more detail, Jesus uses the Daniel 7 passage to say that his first coming was about vindication and triumph. It's about judgment on everything that opposes God's call and God's gospel. Verses 24 to 27 also have a future fulfilment, but we'll leave that till next week. From Jesus' perspective though, his first coming was the fulfilment of God's plan that God then completed, of course, with Jesus' death and resurrection. The temple, which was supposed to represent all that God stood for, instead it represented all that God didn't stand for. The temple's destruction sealed the whole process and God's plan was vindicated. Now, of course, this all happened with the first coming of Jesus. If you remember what Matthew said in Matthew 5 and verse 17, Jesus said he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And if you remember, one of his last words on the cross was, it is finished. What is finished? All that Jesus came to do, he did. He fulfilled God's promise in Genesis 3.15. There is nothing left for Jesus to do in order to fulfil the Old Testament. Satan has been defeated. The strong man is bound to use Jesus' illustration from Matthew 12. It's also in Mark and Luke. And God is plundering Satan's domain. If you want proof of that, just look in the mirror. The old covenant era that started with God's promise of victory in Genesis 3 and finished with the first coming of Jesus is now complete. And we now live in the new covenant era, which will finish with the return of Jesus, which we'll look at further next week. But in this new covenant era, the physical temple is no more. So it was good that it was destroyed in 70 AD. But persecution will still come our way. In all that, we are to rejoice because we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. Thank you, Peter. We're going to finish with a song, Everyone Needs Compassion.
everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. going to read the doxology. To him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you before his glorious presence without fault, with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.